Alrighty. Open your Bibles if you would, please, to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, that's where we will be starting this morning. Pretty much staying. Now, one of the things that motivated me on this lesson today was sometimes I get to thinking, what's the point? What's the point of why we uh, come together each week? Come together, pray a little, sing a couple of songs, maybe shake some hands. I preach a lesson, and we go home, and then ideally we do it again at some point. Come together Thursday, come together Sunday, come together Thursday, come together Sunday. Uh, so what is it that we're really doing? Is this really what the Lord wants? Are we serving our purpose as far as our assembling together is concerned? Uh, and I'm not talking about necessarily uh, issues of evangelism, things that we do when we, when we go out, but I'm talking just specifically the assembly, the coming together of the church. Are we serving our purpose? Are we doing what is expected of us to do? Now, obviously, again, when we leave this place, I can't follow any of you home. I mean, I suppose I could, but I'm not going to. I'm not going to follow you home. I'm not going to watch what you do with your daily lives. I'm not checking up on you at work. Uh, nothing like that. Uh, what we do and what we learn here, uh, that's going to be ultimately between each of us and the Lord, whether we're going to live it or not. And we need to look at ourselves and say, okay, am I doing what is expected of me when I'm not here? Then I mostly want to concentrate on here, on the gathering, on the assembly. Uh, what are we supposed to be doing? Are we fulfilling our necessary job? Uh, I remember not too long back speaking to a young girl who had used to come with, to this church for uh, vacation Bible school. And she came for a few years. And she stopped me and told me, and I didn't recognize her at first because in kids, you know, they grow, they change, but I look about the same. So she recognized me. And she came to let me know that she'd gotten baptized. And I said, well, that's wonderful. And I asked her about her current church, what, uh, what she does there, what does she learn there? And she told me about how they have a Christian fear factor. And that they uh, are supposed to do crazy things and eat weird stuff and this and that. And uh, that was kind of basically her mindset of what was happening in the church. And I didn't really have the heart to tell her that it didn't seem to me that that's what a church is supposed to be doing. It's Now, and I understand, of course, maybe she's not telling me the whole thing. Maybe she is being taught some good, some good biblical things through that. I don't know, but it, it, her mind seemed to be set primarily on the fun and not on any teachings. Uh, you know, we hear about other churches, we, we hear about so many events and so many programs they have going on. We've lost people in our church because they wanted to be in a church where there were programs. They wanted to be in a church, in a church where there were events. They wanted to have something going on for the kids all the time and something going on for the adults and uh, so many different things. And, you know, you got churches today who have their, their big music programs, uh, whether they're what I would consider good having a nice choir, maybe an orchestra, and you got two or three songs done by them. And then on the other side of the spectrum, you got the rock and roll concerts, where the church is basically transformed into a, into a stadium or a club, and they have the lights and the, and the fog machines and the rock and roll going. Uh, you know, there just seems to be a lot more happening than what we do here. So many events, so many programs, so many classes, and. Well, we just kind of come together and pray and sing and preach and we're done. So, I've found, of course, the best way of dealing with such questions is to look at the Bible. Okay, look at the Bible to see what the first church did, okay, what the churches did, and not just in Acts, though we're going to kind of be concentrating there this morning, uh, but, uh, but the churches throughout the New Testament. You know, we see a lot uh, here in Acts as to what the very first church did, and that's kind of what we'll be looking at today. But we have, of course, other, uh, many of the epistles were written directly to the churches with instructions on what the churches were supposed to be doing. Uh, and 
I'm not going to say that what if, if churches are doing something different than what we're doing, that they're necessarily wrong or necessarily right, or that what we're doing is always necessarily, you know, that there's necessarily a wrong or right to it. Uh, I believe there are those things, but uh, the Bible actually gives a lot of leeway in what a church can do, although there are some very specific things that we should be doing, and I think there are some specific things we should not be doing. But uh, what I want to look at is what we do is what we're doing right. I'm not saying is what we're doing the only right way, but is what we're doing right. Can people go out of here and say, man, that church doesn't know what's going on. They're so boring. They didn't have to... I mean, can, can they do that because of what they see in the Bible? Well, they should have this and have that. Okay, show me. That's what we're going to look at today. So look at Acts chapter 2. We're going to start reading verse 41. It says, verse 41, that they that gladly received his word. Well, you know what? Let's go to verse 37. Let's start this. Uh, and that, uh, just, just to let you know, at this point, Peter has been preaching on the day of Pentecost to all the different Jews who were there from the different nations. He's been preaching to them. And it says here, this is the result, verse 37. Now when they heard this, when they heard his preaching, they were pricked in their hearts and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Okay, they were convicted in their hearts. They were pricked by what they were hearing. They knew that they needed to act on it. So they asked, what should we do? And that's a good question. When the Holy Spirit moves on you, you should be able to ask somebody, what do I do? I want to do something with this. Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children, and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about three thousand souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together, and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men, as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God, and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Now, there are a lot of people out there who say, we are the ones doing it right. We're doing it right. There's a lot of different churches out there, and they're saying, we're the ones who are most like the original church. The Catholic Church will tell you that. Uh, and just about every church is going to make that argument that they are the ones doing it right, because they're the ones doing it like the original church. Now, here's the funny thing. Even though I'm going to kind of be going off what the original church did, uh, how the original church did it is not necessarily the only right way to do it. So there's what we need to consider as we look into this. But, since this is kind of what we're looking at today, we're going to look at how the first church did it and see, do we do it kind of like the first church? Okay? Can we look at ourselves and say, are we doing it rather like them? Uh, for instance, the house church people will tell you, we're doing it right. Why do they say that? Well, they're called the house church movement because they only meet in houses. There will only be in the houses of the church members. They say the first church did not all meet together in some uh, building. They didn't have a church building. They didn't own something. And then all come together there and put in a bunch of money to take care of the church. They just met in houses. Now, in a sense, they're correct, but not completely. Uh, I want you to notice in verse uh, 46, what does it say here? It says, they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. So it does say here that they broke bread from house to house. And we'll go into the issue of breaking bread shortly, what they mean by that. But it also tells us that they met daily where? 
in the temple. Now, why were they meeting daily in the temple? Well, <clears throat> some people will tell you, well, because they were good observant Jews, and that's what they should be doing. No, no, they were now born again Christians. Now, were a lot of them still observant Jews? Yeah, because they hadn't learned yet to, to break away from that. And, uh, and there were aspects of it that were still fine to do. But unless they were there every day, all 3,000 of them, sacrificing, there was no reason for them to meet in the temple every day. Uh, the reason they met in the temple every day, I believe, is because it was the one place, worship and God related, where they could bring 3,000 people all at one time and preach to them. Because within, now when it says the temple, they weren't in the building of the temple. They were in one of the courtyards of the temple. And some of those courtyards were pretty big. And so you could easily take 3,000 people, gather them all into one corner, and they could sit and listen to the preaching. So, so they met in one place. Now it does say again that they also met from house to house, but it says they broke bread from house to house. <coughs> so there was some meeting going on in the houses, but it wasn't exclusively what they were doing. They were also meeting in the temple. So it wasn't just the, a, a house meetings going on. That was a part of it. But there is no command to do so. And we see they met in the temple. So just because somebody meets in the houses doesn't mean they're right because that's how they did it at first because at first they didn't. And there's also quite a bit of evidence that archaeologically found that it wasn't long after the beginning of the church that they began to meet in buildings that were designated primarily for meeting the church. They had built-in baptismals, like many churches have today, and things of that sort, where they would come and gather, not just in a house. Uh, let's face it, some of the time they only had one church in a whole town. You know, when the, 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 the book of Corinthians was written to the church, singular, at Corinth. Now, how big would a house have to be to fit all of the Christians in, Cor in Corinth into one place? Now, maybe they started small enough to meet in a house, but eventually you're going to have to grow that. So, as, as, as these churches grew, uh, and if there was still just one church, they would have to have a building to meet in outside of a normal house. Uh, other people now, so, 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 so as far as the house church move, we see that's not necessarily the case that they've been in houses. Then some people will point at groups like the Amish. The Amish, they live separated from much of the world. They live in small, like-minded communities, sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes. And they say, well, the early church all lived in Jerusalem as a community. They had all things common. So that's like the Amish. That's how we are being. Interestingly, the Amish don't generally have all things common. Not that they don't share with one another when there's a need. But uh, they all have their own homes, their own farms, and sometimes generational farms that's been passed down through four or five, six generations, and they're quite large and probably quite wealthy. But, uh, uh, but it's true that in the first church they did live in a single community, Jerusalem. But this was, and they had all things common. But this was primarily for two reasons, from what I can gather in Scripture. Number one, because at this point, Jerusalem was the only place where the word was being preached. They didn't have any options. They couldn't go to the church in Corinth, or the church in Rome, or the church in Galatia, or the church in Ephesus, because those churches didn't exist. There was one church in Jerusalem. So where else are you going to go to hear the preaching? So number one, they were in a single community because they were all in Jerusalem to hear the word of God. Now, why do they have everything in common? Well, there's a reasonable explanation for that and a common sense reason for it. And it's not necessarily the way it always had to be. We don't see that it was always the case. It was because there were a lot of people now, remember 3,000 people got saved on the day of Pentecost. Okay, 3,000. And they added them to the 120 that were already the church in Jerusalem. Uh, and then the Bible says they added daily, the Lord added daily to the church. So that number of 3,000 went up quickly. Now all those 3,000 people who got saved on the day of Pentecost were not all residents of Jerusalem. The people who were listening to the gospel being preached were people from all different nations. All the different countries around the area who would come together for the day of Pentecost heard the preaching and 
got saved, and so they stayed in Jerusalem. They didn't live in Jerusalem. They weren't from Jerusalem. They didn't have a home in Jerusalem. They didn't have a job in Jerusalem. But they stayed in Jerusalem. So now, maybe upward of 2,000, 2,500, I mean, we can only guess at the numbers of people who were from outside the area. But now suddenly you've got thousands of people living in Jerusalem who had no means of support. So the people who did sold what they had in order to help those who were living there with nothing to see that everybody's needs were met. There was a reason for it. And again, we know it was never meant to be the rule. It was not a direct commandment that they do that. And in fact, when, uh, when Ananias and Sapphira, in uh, I believe chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira, it says that in chapter 5, verse 1, a certain man named Ananias and Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now this is what people were doing. They were selling their properties, bringing the money, and laying it at the feet of the apostles for them to disperse as there was need. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Oh no, he was supposed to give everything. Well, no, not exactly. Let's keep reading. While it remained, was it not thine own? Okay? Before you sold the property, wasn't it your property? Yeah. And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Once you had sold the property and you had all that money, wasn't it still yours to do it as you chose? Absolutely. Why hast thou conceived this thing in thy heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. And great fear came on all them that heard these things. So it wasn't that he went and only gave part of the money, because it was his to do with as he chose. He could have said, Peter, here's 75% of the money I made on my house. I'm keeping this 25% because I need it to live. He didn't have to give the whole thing. But what he did is he said, here's everything that we made off the money, off, off the property. They, or in other words, they, they, they lied and they either they specifically said it or they implied that what they were giving was all they had made off of their property. They didn't have to give all of it. They could have given 10 bucks and kept the rest of themselves if they had chose. Because as he says, once it was sold, it was in your hands to do with as you chose. He could have given whatever percentage he gave and been honest about it, and that would have been fine. But he lied and pretended that this was all of it to make himself seem better, and he got called on it because he lied. So, what? You know, I'm going to laugh about something. Oh, she can't see it on camera. She'll tell us later. Um, women be silent in the church. Sorry, let's keep it. All right. So, uh, so they didn't have to have all things common. They chose to. Where Ananias and Sapphira had a problem was that they lied and pretended they'd given everything when they hadn't. You know, if you're going to give, give. Give as you felt led to give. As God blesses you and gives to you, so give again according to your heart. But don't lie about it. And this was where they made the mistake. So, uh, now as far as having all things common, it's not necessarily a bad thing. We don't have to have all things common at this point, but I believe as Christians we ought to have the attitude of all things I have belong to God. All my money, all my property, all my possessions are God's because I only have them because God has blessed me with them. And when we truly believe that, then when we see brothers in need, when we see the brethren, and by the way, it was not that they weren't just giving to anybody, they were giving to believers. They weren't the first bank of Jerusalem to give to whoever wanted money. It was to give to believers. It was to help the brethren. And if we truly believe that what we have belongs to God anyways, it will give us a heart that is far more generous to helping needy believers. And by needy, I don't mean, you know, I want to buy a monster drink, or, you know, I want something. It's about helping meet needs. That's what it's about. So, and if we believe that
that all things belong to God anyways, then we'll have no problem helping the brethren when there's a need, and then trusting that God will see to our needs as well. You know, part of why Dewey and I have this property, and part of her heart and having it long before I was around, was that there's going to probably come a day when it's going to be tough to get by. And some brethren might need a place to go. And we have 80 acres out there. And if you want to come out and you want to do a little back-breaking work and clear yourself a little space and bring out a trailer to live, that's what it's going to be there for. You know, in case there comes a time in our life that, there, that that's a need. And, and that's the intention. We don't want 80 acres. Yes, we got 80 acres. I got to do that. I got 80 acres. Aren't I rich? You know, I don't want... No, it's to use. So we see that being a Christian community isn't what makes a group like the first church. Okay? Uh, so what is it? How does the church know if it is doing what God wants us to do? How do we know whether or not we're living like the first church or, 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 or being like the first church? Well, simply, what did the first church do? What did they do? And then we can take that and we can correlate it to what we do or we don't do. And we can kind of judge ourselves. So verse 41, back in Acts chapter 2, says, Then they that, were, that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So they received the word. That means they got saved. Okay, they received it because they believed it. Born again in the heart, and they were baptized, and they were added to the church. A real church is made up of what this church was made up of born again, baptized believers in Christ. Now that's what a church is. One cannot be considered a part of a church unless they have received the Word of God, meaning they've been saved and then baptized. Properly, scripturally, by immersion. It's got to be done right. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. This is what we teach and we practice. Okay? Now that doesn't mean that unsaved people can't come and hear and learn and come to a potluck and have a cup of coffee <coughs> and enjoy a fellowship. But they need to be here to come and to hear so that they can get saved. How, how long were you guys here before you got saved? Probably six months, eight months, something like that. It was a little while. When did you start? You were 19, I think. 18, 19. 19. But uh, it was about six or eight months. So when you guys were first here, you were not saved. But you heard the gospel, you heard the preaching, and over time the Lord worked on your hearts and you got saved. I hope. August. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, I didn't kick you out because you weren't saved, but you weren't part of the church either. You can't be a part of the church body until you're born again, because that's what a church is. It is a called out assembly of born again baptized believers. That's what a church is. So, uh, so in that way, we match the first church. Not every church teaches that. Um, when uh, Delia used to meet here at the, uh, the Assembly of God many, many years ago, before she was a Christian, and they baptized her, made her a member of the church. Um, never asked if she was saved. She wasn't saved. She wasn't born again. But she got baptized. Why? Because most unsaved people think there's some magical thing about baptism, right? It's, well, and I was a New Ager. And she was a New Ager. Baptism's a big mystical thing. And in the New Age. It was a magical thing. It yeah. was. I wanted the, the, the magic of this, the ritual. Yeah. And of course, we as Christians know there yeah. is no magical, mystical thing with the ritual of being baptized. It's merely an act of obedience once you're saved. It doesn't do anything for you except it's that first act of obedience as a new Christian. But she didn't know that, and they never bothered to ask. Now, I would never baptize someone that I wasn't pretty sure they were saved. Now, it doesn't mean a person can't lie. It doesn't mean a person can't claim it. Um, we've had that. But, I mean, we can only ask and believe that, they're, that, it's, that it's true. You know, but, it, but but we don't look at trying to make people a part of the church without at least asking and trying to verify that they're saved. Sometimes, though, it's not until later on when you see their fruit and it ain't so good that you realize you made a mistake. 
So the first thing, and this is what we teach and what we believe and what we seek to practice here, born again, baptized, and then become added to the church. So right there, we're doing pretty good. Okay? We're doing well. Number two, verse, uh, verse 42. It says, They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Now that word steadfastly, it means to be firmly fixed in place, to be immovable, not subject to change, firm in belief or loyal. That's what that word steadfast means. Immovable is probably one of the best ones. Just immovable. You're an immovable object. You ain't gonna go. Now here's the part where personal responsibility before the Lord comes into play. Are we steadfastly continuing in doctrine? Do we not just believe in it, but believe firmly in it, and stand in it, and remain in it? Are we steadfastly, are we immovable and loyal in how we keep the teachings of the Word of God? Are we holding fast in fellowship with one another? And what is the fellowship? Part of the fellowship is our assembly. Uh, our time in communion with one another. Are we steadfast? Are we steadfast in the doctrines? Do we believe firmly in what we're taught and we're not blown about by every wind of doctrine? We have a good friend, I'm not going to say his name, um, used to attend this church some time back. And since he left, he just blows around from one wind of doctrine to the other. And, it, and it's sad, because he's smart. And I know he's saved, but he keeps jumping in with other people and grabbing other doctrines, and he's just from here, and he's there, and he's there, and he's here, and he's just kind of everywhere. And it's, and it's sad, because he's not a dummy, and he's known the truth, but he just keeps jumping on different bandwagons. And, and, and it's sad. That's exactly the opposite. That, that is not steadfast. Okay? What does it say? Continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrines. Now, I want you to understand, uh, it doesn't mean you can't question the doctrines I teach. You should question it. If you think I'm wrong, get into the Word and prove all things according to the Word of God. I'm not perfect. I try to do my best. I try to follow the Lord and follow His Word, but I have made some mistakes in the past. And if you've got a question, you've got a doubt, question me. But, you know, by Scripture, not according to your will. Pastor, that doesn't feel right to me. I don't care much about how you feel. I mean, I want you to feel good, but uh, as far as what the doctrines are, it doesn't matter how you feel. It's what the Word of God says. But when you know it, you hold to it. Don't be blown around by a good doctrine. Okay, and breaking of bread. Okay, so they continue steadfastly in breaking of bread. Now, what does that mean? There's two, two schools of thought on that. Number one is having the Lord's Supper, observing the Lord's Supper between believers. And that may well be correct. That might be right. Okay. That means that, huh? A graham cracker. Well, I'm not a graham cracker, but a little cracker and a little cup of juice. But, uh, uh, but it could be that. It could be that at that time they were meeting every day and having the Lord's Supper among each little group from house to house. What? Or it could mean eating a meal together. Because remember, in this community, in this, in this time period, in this culture, uh, hospitality and giving food to other people was a big part of the culture. You know, that hospitality of having strangers in your home and sharing your food with them was a big deal. So it could very well be referring to that as well. I'd say, and it could even be referring to both. Maybe they were having Lord's Supper and having a meal. I don't know. I don't know for certain, but either one would probably be not a bad way of looking at it. Um, now, we don't have Lord's Supper every Sunday, certainly not every day. And in fact, it's kind of been a while since we have. We really should. The main reason I haven't is because there's just not many of us here to have it. But I suppose that doesn't really matter. Um, it's not about the numbers, and it's not about how much we're getting along with each other. It's about remembering, each one of us individually remembering the Lord's sacrifice for us on the cross. It's just a regular remembrance of that, and we probably ought to do it next week. Uh, okay, so how about prayers?
continue steadfastly the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and in prayers. Okay, this is again another one of those places where I can't say what we're doing. Okay, it's up to you guys what you're going to do when you're at home, when you're not together. But are you continuing in prayer? You know, prayer is one of those things we should be in all the time. We should be praying for prayer. everything. Pray for all things. Whether we think they're good, whether they think they're bad, we pray for it all. Every little situation in our life that you're facing, you should pray for it. See the ambulance go by. Pray for the ambulance drivers and pray for whatever they're going to see to you. You know, everything should be an issue of prayer for the Christian. Prayer is how we talk to God. It is our lifeline. It's our means of communication. If we're not talking to Him, you know, how can we say we love Him? How could I say I love my wife if I never talk to her? You know, if I, if I talk to her as much as some people pray, she'd be out the door. Because there's no proof that I love her. We should be praying to God all the time because He is our Savior. He's our Lord. He's our God. He's our Creator. He wants us to talk to Him. He even wants us to ask things from Him. That's what that word prayer actually means, to ask, to request. That's where the worship comes in. That's when we're not asking for anything. We're just worshiping and recognizing Him for who He is. He wants us to do that. He desires us to do it. Prayer Praying always with all prayer. That's a lot of prayer. So we need to be people of prayer. Uh, verse 44. All that believed were together and had all things common. Okay, we see, we've already talked about having all things common. But what about they, uh, they, they were together? Okay. Uh, again, when we deal with the issues of having things common, there may come a time when we might need to really literally share everything because there may not be enough to go <coughs> otherwise. Um, if we fall into persecution, we may have none to rely on but one another and God. And the Lord expects us to help one another. Uh, verse 46, And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, let's see that again, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, so, uh, again, continuing daily in one accord in the temple. Again, this, we could liken this to the meeting together of the church, the assembly together. Uh, formal training in the doctrines of the Word of God. Most would just call it going to church. I don't really like that because we don't go to church. We are the church. We are the assembly of the church. We are the church. The building is not the church. The church isn't something we go to. It is a gathering of the church. So I guess you could say going to the church house, but uh, uh, we go there because that's the place where the teaching is happening. And that's why they went to the temple. They went daily with one accord to the temple. Now they were in one accord. That means they all had the same mind. They had the same goal. They wanted to go. They wanted to learn the same truth. And that's where we should be today. We should be in one accord. We should be uh, one God, one doctrine, or one set of doctrines. Uh, one spirit, one baptism, one Lord, one Savior, one. There's not, well, you know, we'll just have to agree to disagree. No, we can't do that and say we're in one accord. That's called compromise. Um, sometimes we have to do that with other, with Christians from other churches because we might have some differences in some, un, some minor areas. If they're major areas, areas of, of, of solid truth, then there might need to be separation. But, uh, you know, some areas like the issue of, uh, of the timing of the rapture. Okay? I'd say the important thing is we believe there's going to be a rapture. That's clear from Scripture. There's enough evidence for the very different timings of the rapture that very intelligent people can disagree on it. People who really know their Bible, who truly believe in God, who truly believe it's going to happen, can have differences of when it's going to happen. There's enough obscurity on the subject that I say, well, you know what? If we differ on it, we'll get over it. The Lord will come when He comes, but we believe He's going to come. Now, not everybody believes that. Some people say, oh, no, man, preacher of rapture, uh, that, that's a fundamental. If you don't believe it, then we can't have nothing to do with you. Well, if that's how you feel, that's how you feel. I don't believe that. I believe the Lord's going to come when He comes, and honestly, that's one of the doctrines I hope I'm wrong on, because 
because I would like to not be here when all of that happens. <laughs> Very honestly. I would like not to have to be here during the tribulation period because it's not going to be a fun time. And more than likely, if we are here, we're going to lose our lives. We're going to die for our faith during that time. So I'd like to miss that. Um, but I'm prepared it comes. So, uh, but we need to be in one doctrine, in, in, in one accord. Uh, we believe in the old beliefs, the old ways. Uh, uh, today, many of those things are being discarded. Uh, but uh, if we want to be a true church, we've got to be in one accord. And that's how the first church was, and that's how we should be. And I think so far we've done pretty well. That's why there's so few of us. Because those who could not be in one accord have left. Those who didn't want to hold to some certain doctrines we hold to didn't want to stay. And so they left. And I had said, well, if it, if it whittles us down to next to nothing, at least we're next to nothing, but we're in one accord. And that puts us closer to following the Lord properly. All right, verse 47. Praising God and having faith with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Praising God. Do we praise God? As a church, do we praise God? Yes. I think we do. We sing. When we're singing, we're singing praises to Him. We speak of Him. We speak of Him highly. We, uh, we praise Him. We thank Him for our salvation. We thank Him that He sent His Son. That we thank God that He sent His Son to die for us. We thank Him for our health. We thank Him for our well, for our meeting our needs, for our daily bread. We thank Him, we praise Him, because He's worthy of our praise. Can we praise Him more? Probably. We should praise Him more in our personal lives. But since we're mostly dealing with the church, uh, yes, I think that we praise Him. We've been able to even praise Him for what we've lost. And that's important, because if we've lost things, but we're still His church, we understand that was His will. And we allow Him to do His will with us. And if there needs to be a breaking down of us in order to do something with us, then praise God for it. You know, again, maybe He'll bless us with that church. We'll have something new to praise Him for. And then we can praise Him as we're laboring to get it usable again. You know, um, it's going to take some time. But if the Lord does it, then we praise Him. And if He doesn't do it, you know what? We'll praise Him for that too. Because we can still meet. We can still come together. He's still blessed us with a place to meet. He deserves our praise. Regardless of what we have or don't have, he deserves it. So I believe in that area, we're meeting that. Okay, we're following the, the, the first church. If you've been saved, if you're born again, you have every reason to praise him. He could never do another thing for you when you have reason to praise him for your whole life. Because you're not going to hell. If you've been born again, you have an eternal inheritance. Eternal here, it's not internal in there. Yeah, that too. So you have that to praise him for. Finally, the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. Is the Lord adding to the church? Not really. Not right now. Not to ours. To some churches, he's adding. Um, this doesn't just mean new Christians coming, though it can partially mean that, but really this is referring to new born again converts. We're not seeing new converts here. Um, so I'd have to say no, we're not really following here. But also notice that it was the Lord who was added to the church. But how were they added? Well, because the people of God were preaching the word and people were responding. So we can rightly assume that this was how it was done afterward. The new converts told their friends, told their families and others about what they heard, and they were saved, and they were added to the, to the church. Um, we as Christians have a responsibility. If we're going to see the Lord adding to the church, we as Christians need to give the invitation. We have a job to do. It is the Lord who ultimately will add. It's the Lord who ultimately will uh, will we'll bring about the harvest, but we've got to do the work of spreading the seed. The only two reason that you two are saved is because I spread a seed to your dad. And that seed took a little while to grow, but eventually he heard what he liked and he came and he brought you guys and over time you guys got saved. That's because of spreading the word. If I hadn't done that, who else would be here today? There probably wouldn't be a church here today. Because right now, you guys are kind of a church. And you're busy. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. 
So, uh, so if the Lord is going to add, we have to do our part. We've got to do what we need to do. And it takes time. Okay, At the time, there was great growth going on because the Lord was building a new church. And so it was going, going, going like crazy. Things in this day and age have slowed down. We're coming to the end. There's less people getting saved. There's less moving to the Spirit, mostly because believers are not moving as we should be moving. Uh, there's a lot of problems with, with, with quick prayerism, with people uh, uh, going out and just convincing people they need to get saved right now. Make a decision right now. But I don't know anything. Doesn't matter. Just believe. Just pray. Do you believe? Well, I believe. Okay, then pray. All right, I believe in that. Okay, you're saved. Praise God. See you later. It can take some time. It took you guys about six to eight months. It takes time, but we need to give the gospel. You're, you're talking to your friend at work. It takes time. It's the same subject. Huh? It's all this is the same subject. <laughs> and what subject? The doctrinal what, salvation? Just, just the whole thing. It's just everything you said so far is the same thing we are talking about. So okay. Trash. <laughs> well, keep her, keep her, keep her, try to keep it centered in the gospel. She needs to be saved. Why she needs to be saved. So, uh, so we, we as a church need to be busy. We as a church, as individuals, and as a group, we need to be giving the gospel to the lost. And then the Lord can bring those numbers in. And then the Lord can bring those souls uh, to fruition and they can be saved. So the church can't stand or fall on me. And it can't stand or fall on just one or two of us. It's got to stand on all of us, all of the members doing their part. Each body part working together for the good of the whole. We're kind of like communists in that way, but, uh, but in a more pure form. Uh, it's got to stand upon each member doing their part. We each, each give of ourselves, of our talents, of our abilities, of our time, yes, even of our money, for the effectual moving of the Church of God in our little slice of the world that we've been called to. If we want to continue to be as the, as, as, as the first church as much as possible, We've got to go back to the principles of the first church. We've got to make God our priority. We've got to make souls our passion, a zeal for the knowledge and the wisdom of God. We're a fundamental Baptist church, independent fundamental Baptist. Sometimes we just need to look again at the fundamentals of the beginning. Now, not to say that everything that any other church does, if they have a big choir, they have a big orchestra, they have 20 classes going on, or not to say that any of those things are wrong. As a church grows, sometimes ministries grow and spread and happen, and that's, and that's fine. The Bible doesn't say we can't do that. Okay, I think it's a good thing when they do. But right now we're just a small church, so we don't have as many things going on. But what we have, I believe, is right according to the Word of God. I believe that where we are is proper, but we need to not be happy saying that we're okay. We need to seek to grow, because growth means souls to the kingdom of God. That's what that means. So we look at the fundamentals, we look at the beginning, and we move forward from there. And I pray that we will be in one accord when we seek to do this. And you guys are going to learn a whole lot when you go to that meeting on how they do things. You're going to hear ideas about soul winning, about going door knocking, about spreading the gospel, things that, you know, that you're not really necessarily hearing here from me. Because you've got a whole bunch of people and a whole lot of experience going on out there. And you're going to learn some good things. I hope you'll grab it. I hope you'll use it. I hope we will too. Because there's things to do. And there's people from big churches and people from little churches going there and some Exactly, and that's what we need. In the in the uh, 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 oh, what's that verse? In the, in the multitude of counselors, there's safety. Lots of people, lots of ideas. It's a good thing. I'm looking forward to it. Let's pray. Our gracious heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God, for your word. We thank you, Father, for these examples we've been given to the first church, Lord. And it's not that we always necessarily need to be just as the first church, Lord. Uh, we see through the gospels. Or not through the gospel, but through the epistles, Father, how the churches grew, how there were changes of how things were done, especially once the persecution came and they had to spread, uh, and they began to uh, bring the Gentiles in, Father, and uh, just 
Lord, we know there's not necessarily we have to keep to the first church. There are those who I know who believe that, Father, and there's probably nothing wrong with it to a point, Father, but, uh, uh, but Lord, what we want to do, Lord, here is we want to grow, Father. We want to see souls saved, Father. We want to see the word go forth. We want to see your name glorified and, and praised in the sight of the lost, Father, so that they might be saved, Father. We want people to see Christ in our lives, Lord, so that uh, we can speak to them of the gospel and they'll be saved, Father, when they see that our lives match our words. Father, I pray that that would be the case, Lord. Help us not to be hypocrites of, our, of who we are, Lord. Let us truly live what we believe, Father. And I pray, Lord God, that you would just use us, Lord, for your work, Father, and that this little church might uh, raise up, Father, to glorify your name and to praise you, Father, and to be a light in this dark place. Father, I just thank you, Lord, for your goodness. I thank you, Father, for all you've done for us. And I just ask, oh God, if any of us are not sure that if we die today, that we go to heaven. I pray, Lord, that we would get that right with you before we take another step today. And I just thank you, and I praise you, and I pray all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.